I said, well, here's what I'd like to do. And they said, no, we're going to tell you what to do. We need you to do one of those boy-girl detective shows. I said, what? They said, yeah, you know, Heart to Heart's in its fifth or sixth year. We'd like to freshen it up. We'd like to find a new version of that. We'll get some guy in a tuxedo. We'll get some girl who's blonde with a great body. And they'll go solve crimes. And, and that's what you'll do. And I said, oh, don't make me do that. I hate that. I'm not the guy to do that. Please don't ask me to do that. I can't do that. They said, well, that's what you're doing. You've spent $4 million of our money because these pilots cost about $2 million bucks each back then. They were two hours long. And we want this boy-girl detective thing. And I said, I just honestly don't. And they said, look, Glenn, this is what you need to do. We'll get you like Cheryl Ladd. I remember that was the name that was thrown around. And we'll find some guy. And you can do whatever you want with it, but that's what you need to do. And all I heard at that point was you can do whatever you want with it. And I thought, all right, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to lampoon it. Because back then on television, every other show was private detectives. Private detectives were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. And I used to say, you know, because I, I lived in, in Calabasas and shot at 20th Century Fox. And I said, yeah, it's a long car trip. I never passed one detective agency. Um, uh, you know, and yet they were everywhere on television. So I thought, I, I, I want to do a show that will just kill the genre. So I wrote this two-hour pilot, and about halfway through writing it, I remember thinking, gosh, I think this is Sybil Shepherd." And I mentioned it to my agent. He said, well, let me try and get you a meeting. And I didn't even know you could do that kind of thing. But um, she, uh, we met at a restaurant in the Valley, La Serre, and uh, she said, she said, I've read, it was only half done at that point. She said, I've read your script, and it's, it's a Hawksian comedy. And I think I'd be interested. And I'm thinking, I don't know what a Hawksian comedy is. I study drama, and I don't know what a Hawksian comedy is. And uh, you know, I came to realize that she was talking about Howard Hawks. And you know, all those years of living with Peter Bogdanovich, you know, he would tell her about the American cinema and everything. But I finished the script, and she said, yes, I love this. Let's do this. And now we had to find David Addison. And we looked at, I want to say the number was 1,100 men. Um, Ruben Cannon, who cast the show, had searches in, obviously in New York and LA, but also in Chicago, Toronto. I mean, he went all over trying to find this guy. And, um, and, and I would have all these crazy ideas. At one point, there was a, a disc jockey here in Los Angeles who was very popular at the time named Rick Dees, and I thought, well, Rick Dees would be perfect for this, and, and he turned us down. I don't know if he ever came in and read. I think we just had a conversation, and he said, you know, I don't know how to make this work, you know. He was usually, I still is, I mean, quite popular. And um, um, I had all these kind of nutty ideas about how to cast it. And finally, the network came to me and said, you know what, we're going to pay you and Bob Butler and Sybil Shepherd off. We're not going to make this thing, because we're convinced the part is uncastable. Bill Murray has a movie career, and there's no one to play this part. And we continued to try and look, try and find somebody. I didn't really believe them. I was very young and very headstrong. And um, the next day we did an audition, I don't know, 10, 11 guys, and one of these guys came in, and I went, that's him. And it was Bruce Willis. His head was shaved, and he had all these earrings, and he was wearing combat fatigues. And, and when he was done, he left, and I turned to the other people, and I said, that's him. And they, they thought I was talking about the guy before him. I said, no, 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 him. And they, went, they looked at me and they went, him? I said, him, yeah, absolutely. I said, we got to get him back here. We got to clean him up. We got to, you know. We brought him to the network. We brought him 11 times. And he was the only person I ever brought to the network and said, this is my choice. And they turned him down 11 times. <laughs> he would read for them. I mean, it was just, it was painful. There was like a jazz or so. I, I don't know. He was, we were, literally almost exactly the same age. We had very similar backgrounds. Um, and he, people don't understand how hard that part was. It was extremely verbal. Um, and it needed to be, and I mean, when you go back, the, the text was so dense. You know, we would do 90 page scripts for a 44 minute episode. And he, of all the actors we saw, and as I say, I think it was like, I didn't see 1100, I saw about 300, but they saw 1100, only three out of all those actors were actually able to, to do the role technically. I mean, understood the text and were able to deliver the text and all that. And those three, curiously, those three were Bruce, Adam Arkin, and Dennis Dugan. I felt 
neither Dennis nor Adam made sense next to Sybil. But Bruce, to me, Bruce walked in the room to me and I, I went, I was trying to make a series. Part of what I was doing too was I was sort of responding to what was on television. What was on television at that point was this sort of sensitive guy everywhere. You know, Alan Alda was, I guess, sort of the prototype. Everywhere you looked, there was this sort of thoughtful, sensitive guy. And I was in my 20s and that wasn't my experience. My experience was guys aren't sensitive. They want to have fun and you know, the world is much more sexually charged than that and much less nice. And I wanted to do sort of a kick-ass comedy. That was what I was interested in. So when Bruce walked in the room and started, to, and he completely got the text, I got very excited. But as I said, I brought him 11 times and they said no. And then I said, it's because you're not seeing the chemistry. You need to see the chemistry. It's like Abner can tell you, you have to see the chemistry. Let me do a screen test. Let me put him on film. And they said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Put him on film. And they had somebody they liked too, that I just didn't see at all. So I put, the idea was to put Bruce on film with Sybil, but Sybil wouldn't go on film. I said, you got to do this. They're going to pay us off. We're not going to have a show. She said, I'm not, I'm not going to. I said, why? She said, because I'm afraid when you see me on film, you won't want me. I said, that's absurd. So we hired another actress and said to her, you're not getting this part. You're just playing this part in this test. Uh, really good at Mary Margaret Hume, I want to say was her name. I think I'm right about that. Um, and we did the screen test and brought it to ABC and they looked at it and they went, oh, you know, and because it's sort of like Martin and Lewis, but no Lewis or no Martin. You know what I'm saying? You can't. And I said, all right, all right, we blew it. We need another screen test and I'll get Sybil to do it. And they said, well, you spent $35,000 on the first screen test. We're not going to give you any. And I pleaded and begged and pleaded and begged. And um, finally they said, all right, here's $15,000. They gave me some crazy figure. And I went back to Sybil. I said, Sybil, you got to do this. You just got to do this. And she very grudgingly said, all right. And she wasn't so sure about him. I, she now says she knew the instant, but I'm here to tell you that was not the situation. They did the screen test, and it was a great screen test. And we took it to the network, and I not only did I take the screen test, but I cut it up. I made a little featurette out of it called Great, great Romantic Couples or something. And, you know, Cleopatra and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was, and it was you know, a very entertaining thing. Brought it to the network and screened it. And the lights went up and they said, and this is such a network thing, they said, we need to test this. So they took it to, I think it was called the Preview House, is a place they used to have, where they literally invited tourists in to look at things and turn knobs. And, and of course, the tourists came in, they didn't know who Bruce Willis was, and they, you know, and they were like, we don't know. So I was sort of in the same place, and, 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 and this is a great story. So I go back to ABC and I'm pleading for Bruce. And every time I would take him in, they would say the same thing. They'd go, you know what? He's not a leading man. He's just not, no one's going to believe him next to Sybil Shepherd. You have to understand at that moment in television, Aaron Spelling had all these shows on ABC and all the leading men were a, a particular, they were all very beautiful and, you know, chiseled jawed and, and, you know, they wore, you know, and, and Bruce was a guy, you know. But they would go on and on about, no one will ever believe him with her and uh, women won't find him attractive. And of course, she was sitting in a room filled with men. Yeah, I would, I would bring Bruce to the network and, and I'd get lectured on the fact that he wasn't a leading man. And my experience was when I walked him down the hall, he was such, and still is, I think, but, but certainly then, such a sexual beast. You know, women would just do, there was literally a reaction when you, this guy, no one knew when you'd walk him down the hall. So I knew they were wrong. And one day, finally, um, Ann Daniel, who was, there were really only two women executives at ABC at that time. There was uh, Marcy Carsey, who went on to be Carsey Werner, and Ann Daniel. Ann Daniel was the head of development. And she finally cleared her throat. We were in this meeting with all these guys, and she said, look, I don't know if he's a TV star or not. I don't know if he's a leading man or not. But he sure looks like a dangerous fuck to me. And it just sucked all the air. All these men were gassed. And finally, um, Tony Thomopoulos, who was running the network at that time, turned to me and went, all right, you can make the show, you can make it with him, but whatever you do, don't let them get romantically involved. No one would ever believe it. 
And I said, okay, and we went and made the pilot. And of course they get romantically involved in the pilot. 